Okay. Um, so great, it's good to see that we have like um, four, five people attending. Uh, nevertheless, I will post the, the, the lectures online. Um, is my audio good? Is, is there like a bit of echo? Maybe I can fix for next time. For me, I can hear you. Great. Um, so basically, uh, I will just, uh, I'm using my computer and my uh, iPad at the same time. So I'm presenting with my iPad and everything should, should be okay. Um, but any problems and any questions during the class, just stop me whenever I, even if it's not a math related, you just want to make a comment, please stop me. I, I love making a small talk. Um, so basically, uh, this will be a class about the Bruns book, which you can find his website. If you go to uh, Purdue's uh, university website, you can find him. And then there you can see, I think he's in publications or something like that. And then you can download his book. Um, it's a very uh, uh, nice book. I enjoy it very much. Uh, but it has some very hard problems that, um, that is part of the theory as you can, and all this information I'm giving is in my website as well. You can go there and, and read it. But anyway, um, so this uh, uh, would be a very, at least for me, I'm very excited to be teaching this class. I always wanted to, to do it. So it's supposed to be nice. Um, and basically we're, we're you're about to study, maybe you can put even some like notes here. So we're about to study, uh, basically, so just roughly, we will study uh, some function spaces. And um, of analytic functions. That means that we will have a certain domain, omega, let's say, um, in the complex plane, and which usually will be simply connected. And then we will have a certain function analytic on this domain. Okay, so we have a space of functions uh, analytic in this domain and uh, such that a certain norm, which will be a, a given by a certain linear product, so a certain Hubert norm, is finite, okay? So this is a basic setting. Um, usually this domain omega here is the complex plane, the entire complex plane, or you can be the half plane, let's say for imaginary part of uh, Z bigger than zero, or it could be the unit disk. Okay, and usually this norm, it's some more uh, related with some L2 norm, maybe in the boundary of the domain. Um, if it's the entire complex plane, then maybe it's on the real line. Um, there are other spaces that maybe we'll talk about when you get the, when you put the norm on the whole complex plane, the L2 norm with the weight or not, and etc. Anyway, that's the basic setting. But this is not, uh, if, if you just put this, then uh, you just get a, a huge variety of spaces. Um, uh, you have to impose some other things. And one thing, so that would be the first thing you impose. The other thing you, you, we want to impose, and that gives a structure to the spaces, is that the functional, so you get F. So say this space here is H the space of functions with a finite norm. This norm would be given by inner product. Um, so call this, this, this would be a Hilbert space or at least a candidate for a Hilbert space, H. So for every function in this uh, space, you take a function and you map into its evaluation, okay? Where omega or W is some point in the domain, okay? And that has to be continuous. 
Okay, so you force that. So that means that you have some sort of inequality like this for some constant a omega. Okay. So that's the, the, the which gives structure to the space because uh, in the end, if H is indeed a Hilbert space, so it's complete, then by his representation, you know that, well, this function on here that maps, um, this function that maps F into its value, this functional has to be um, um, given by the inner product against the function. So that implies the existence of a kernel. So that implies that f of w is the inner product, which will be uh, 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 implicit in this norm here that I was mentioning, uh, of f with some kernel, kw, let's say. So what's the kernel means? So why we call it kernel? Because uh, that means that for every w in the domain, uh, there is a function which I'm calling kw that belongs to the space, and that in such that this um, this identity here is true. Okay. So this is the basic um, this is the basic setting that we will uh, we will have. Um, um, and the Brownian spaces is just one instance of this thing, but a very special in instance because it's related with a bunch of other spaces, as Paley-Wiener spaces, for, for, for those which, which already know a little bit. Uh, so the Brownian spaces would be a class of spaces like this, where omega is the whole complex plane. This, uh, this so omega hold the, comp the whole complex plane. This norm here will be a kind of a weighted L2 norm on the real line, and then condition two will follow. Okay. And that would be basically uh, if you impose this, this, these things that I just said, basically the only spaces that has these properties is the Brown spaces. So this is the whole class of spaces where C of omega is the whole complex plane and the norm is the L2 norm of the real line. Um, so this will be related with Hardy spaces for those who know Paley-Wiener spaces and, and some other uh, uh, nice spaces. Okay. So basically, uh, uh, we have to. So before we start the theory, we have to make some preliminary um, uh, things. I have to prove some pre preliminary things, and the first few classes will be about that. We will follow uh, the Brown's book religiously, the meaning that I will do chapter by chapter I, and I will enumerate the theorems exactly as it is in the book. Extra theorems, I will use other letters to, to enumerate them. And, and in the end of every class, I will maybe give a list of problems to be uh, sent back to me, like in, uh, after two weeks, for instance, this class will have a list of problems, uh, five problems. And then you have two weeks to send it back to me. I will grade it. I will give my suggestions and etc. And I will give it back to you. And at some point, we will together decide a cutoff that uh, let's say like I don't know sixty percent. I don't know how, how much it's going to be, um, so that you can uh, so that you can do the other exam. So there will be a cutoff for the other exam. But the point is, the hard part should be solving the problems. And the other exam should be kind of easy, it's just a series of theoretical questions with uh, uh, quick answers. It should be just like a, 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 a making sure that you know the, the, the topic. But the problems should be the hard part. And for that, I'm making office hours uh, every Tuesday, starting today, from, I guess it's 2.30. You have to see my website. I guess it's 2.30 from 4.30 where I'm, I will be there like these two hours and you can like ask me any questions about problems and any questions about the theory and any sort of mathematical question you would like to ask or any sort of advice for your life, or I don't know. I'm open to do any kind of conversation. So I guess anybody has any questions? Um,
before we start the class. Uh, do we make groups for handing in the exercises or is it everybody hand it in him or herself? Uh, so yeah, yeah, everybody hands uh, the exercises separately. Of course, if you have a buddy, you can try to solve the problems together and you will have identical solutions. That's no problem. You can do that if you want. But I really recommend you to try alone. And if you're really struggling with the problem, then you just go to my office hours and I will give you hints and etc. I, I, I went through this book during my PhD. Um, um, I think it was one of the first classes I did in my PhD or even my master's, I don't recall. Anyway, um, and I struggled with the problems as well. And so if you, you can always ask for help from your buddies or, 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 or from me. And are we going to get problems every week or every two weeks? Every, I think it's every just Tuesday. So basically okay. every week, yeah. yeah. Okay. Every week, but it's going to be like a four or five problems at most. Mm -hmm. So you have like two weeks. I mean, you, it's not really two weeks because the next week I will give you more four or four, uh, five problems. But basically you have to solve four or five problems every week. Shouldn't be hard. I will be helping you anyway but it shouldn't be too hard. There are some problems, they're incredibly hard, but uh, um, uh, these ones, yeah, this one, there are some few ones that you really should like come together and try to solve as a group, maybe. I don't know, but we will see as, as we go. Okay, so if we, have, if we don't have any questions, then I, I will start. And uh, okay, just to finish the introduction, what I really like the, about the book is the fact that it's a constant struggle to learn things. And I found that uh, I became a better mathematician after the book. And I only realized that like some months after I finished the class, because it got me a level of, let's say confidence uh, of attacking new topics that uh, I wasn't aware that I had it. So it's, uh, so that's why I'm, I'm excited about it. And I think you benefit from this uh, class a lot, even if you don't use the parent spaces for anything in your life after it. Okay, so, so let's start. So, uh, so class one would be about the fragment Lindelof principle. And as an introduction, let me talk about the maximum principle. Okay. So what's the uh, uh, maximum? What's the maximum principle? Basically, suppose uh, uh, um, as originally stated, suppose you have a function, let's say from the unit desk to the complex plane, which is analytic. So here, D is the unit disk. I'm always setting Z as X plus I Y for a complex variable. And uh, analytic means, well, we should know what analytic means anyway. It means that if you differentiate in Z that derivative exists or from a PDE, let's say a kind of flavor, if it satisfies the uh, Cauchy Heyman equations. That is uh, Cauchy Riemann equations. Okay. Um, another way of saying, which we related uh, with uh, the stuff we will see in the following classes, it's uh, if um, 
uh, the real part is an harmonic function and the imaginary part is the complement, the complementary harmonic function to the real part. That's another way of saying it. Okay, so suppose, suppose you have a function on the unit disk, which is analytic. So the first theorem, which is the maximum principle, which is not a theorem from the book. And if it's not a theorem for the book, I will use uh, letters to enumerate them. Um, so, so in this setting, uh, then uh, the max of f, let's say the moduli of f, to moduli of z less than equal to one, equals the max of moduli of f in the boundary. Okay, so that's what's called the maximum principle, meaning that uh, meaning that the function, the maximum of the function is on the boundary. Okay, so let's go for the proof. And the proof is uh, kind of uh, obvious in a way. So if I just use Um, um, the Cauchy, oh, here I have to assume something more. So maybe I should say analytic. And let me put something more here. Um, analytic and continuous fish analytic in D and should put after it. And continuous in the closure, okay? That should be the additional hypothesis. So I can use, um, so, so saying this thing here makes us any sense because otherwise the function could like have poles in the boundary. Um, anyway, um, so that's, this is the simplest setting. Uh, so let's go for the proof. So basically, well, let's start showing that f of zero uh, is the value of f at zero uh, is beaded by some value at the boundary. And then basically you just use uh, Cauchy's uh, integral formula Okay that is Cauchy's integral formula. And from Cauchy's integral formula, what you can do is basically you do the obvious uh, inequalities. You just put moduli and everything, and then you pass the moduli to the inside the integral. So what you're gonna get is the max of moduli of f in the boundary times the length of the curve which, uh, of the path you're using, which is the unit disk. So it's two pi, but then you divide it by two pi here. So everything cancels nicely and you just get that. So great, so it just show that f of zero is less or equal than the max of the function in the boundary of the unit disk. So that's step one. And then step two, you just use the, the a Mobius transform. You just say that you just use the Mobius transform or A is some point in the unit disk and you realize that T of zero is A and you realize that T maps the unit disk into the unit disk and preserves the boundary. Actually is equal. Okay, and that T is conformal but that's not a, a well, this is just a curiosity, which is this, this, this property here is what is important. And so once you have this, you realize that if I do F of A in model I, that will be just F composed with T at zero. Okay. 
But then by the previous result, that is just previous calculation that is less or equal than the max model i of z equals one. I should put it. of f composed with t of z but then since t preserves the boundary that is equal to and there you go so you just now show that f of a of any point uh, in the inside loses to some point on the boundary and that finishes the proof Okay. Um, and that basically is a basic, uh, basically a simple thing. And you can, well, there is a way of showing this for every domain. So let me put this as a remark. And we will actually use that in a moment that if you have any domain in the complex plane, which is simply connected, Okay, it doesn't have any holes and it's open. Huh? Um, and you have a function f which is analytic and continues on the closure, then the same result holds. Then the max of f in omega is, uh, I'm sorry, in omega bar is equal to the max of f in the boundary. Okay. Um, and basically, if you know things about conformal transformations, since this domain can be conformally mapped into the unit disk is basically this proof that I just gave you would show this as well, but using um, like a, using a atomic bomb to solve it. You don't need that kind of result to solve it. You can do it in other ways. But anyway, this, this basic proof that I just gave you, it's essentially the same if you use this conformal transformation between the unit disk and this, this omega. Okay, so any questions so far? And uh, so I will always ask any questions so far and I will give like three, four seconds if any, nobody says anything then I would just keep going. Um, okay. And is my uh, handwriting uh, uh, readable? Is can I try that I started well and then is starting to get bad? Any comments? It's uh, very fine for me. <laughs> okay, great. Usually I start very uh, with a discipline in writing and then I just start to be a complete mess after. But anyway, I will try to be disciplinated in my writing. So, okay, so now we want some other kind of uncertainty, oh, sorry, not uncertainty, um, maximum principle. And that is the next uh, part. So what I want is a uh, maximum principle in the upper half plane, which I will always denote like this. With Z is X plus I Y. So I want the maximum principle in there. Okay. The problem of a maximum principle in there is that, well, the domain is not uh, compact. Okay. So uh, there may be some problems at infinity. And actually there is, for instance, if I use this function here, 
Okay. So this function on the real line, so f of x, again, z will be always x plus i y. So if I evaluate f of x, I mean that x is real. So x and y will always be real. So f of x is immodelized always one for every x real. But if I do f of i y in the upper half plane, then this is just e to the y and x explodes. Okay. So if I want to say that the maxima of f is at the boundary, the boundary of the upper half plane, which would be the real line, I have a problem because this function here seems to uh, be always there. So we would need extra conditions. We need to impose some conditions on the behavior of f at infinity. So, if, so to have a maximum principle in the upper half plane, and that's the fragment Linderlof uh, uh, maximum principle. So let me state it here. And that will be theorem one, which is theorem one from the book. So assume you have some F, which is analytic, and the moduli of F of Z is continuous. up to the boundary, so up to the real line. And then uh, we will assume a certain asymptotic behavior, which will be the following. The limit inf, and I always denote limit inf and limit soups using bars, either above or below the limit notation. So that means limit inf of a going to infinity of one over a let's go from zero to pi log plus of sine theta p theta zero. Okay, so what I'm doing is I'm taking, I will write a picture of it in a moment. So let's assume that I would, and a log plus here, a log plus is just the max of zero and log. Okay. That's log plus. Uh, so assume that then if f of x is less or equal than one for all x real, uh, that implies that f of z is less or equal than one for all z in the upper half plane. Okay. And that's the fragment Lindell of maximum principle. So for instance, um, so let's see if I have, If I have, for instance, an example, let's say an example for that, I think the typical example would be, example is with A, example. So a typical example I think would be something like F of Z equals to E, let's say, mm. Now it has to be, let's say, sine of pi z over pi z, and that works. Let's see, if I take the moduli and take the log, this, this guy here will be like log of z um, so it would be like log of a when I'm dividing by a. So this would be basically log of a. Oh no, because I have an x, maybe that's not the typical example. Anyway, we will see typical examples in the, in the following. Um, let me be, uh, worry about that later. 
Let's see the proof. Um, yeah, let's see the proof. Uh, yeah, maybe maybe a polynomial would be a typical example, but that polynomial will not be bounded by one end of the line. Maybe a Mobius transform would be a typical example. Anyway, um, so let me start with the proof. So basically, uh, we have a very different proof than the one from the unit disk. This one would be way more analytic. So let me start. Let me start with the picture. So what what is that we are doing here? So. So, so this integral here, basically we're taking a semi circle here from minus a to a, and I'm taking the log of the absolute value of f along the same circle. And I'm making an average of this thing. Okay, with a certain weight, which is sine weight. And then I want this thing to be little o of a, meaning when I divide by a, so a is the radii of this semicircle, and I take the limit inf, so not really little o of a, but at least in some sequence when a goes to infinity, some subsequence of a's, I get as close as I want to zero. Okay, so that's uh, what we're doing. So I'm sending this thing to infinity and I'm making an average over it, okay? So, uh, so you can see that with this kind of estimate, and if you know some things already, you really like doing something related with uh, uh, the Poisson kernel and the Cauchy formula. Uh, and, um, so, and that's what's gonna uh, be in the proof. So, so let me define h of theta equal to this function here, so log plus of, and that, for the moment, let me fix a equals one, and then you will see that we can later adapt to uh, any a. Now we do this for a between pi, minus pi and pi, okay. So this is a well-defined continuous function, periodic uh, continuous function. Uh, well, and then I extend, well, yeah, and, and then when I define it from minus pi to pi, then I extend this function periodically, okay? So that's, so that's what, it, sorry? One, one question, uh, in the definition of age, I guess you mean the sine of theta and not the signum, right? Is, 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 this, is this not the sign? Uh, is this word uh, wrong? No, I, I mean, do you mean the sinus or the? Signal? I mean the sign, yes. Uh, is Okay. Is, uh, okay. <laughs> yeah, the, if it's plus or minus, not the sign. Okay, ah, okay. Yeah, right. yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. not the sign, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, that's a good point because you can maybe get confused with this guy here. Okay, nice sketch. Uh, okay, that, that's what I really mean, sign, because, well, let me make a picture then, um, another picture. So what would be uh, h? So basically, well, let's, let's see from theta from zero to pi. So the sign of theta is positive. So from zero to pi, basically just taking the log plus, but f is assumed to be less or equal than one at the real line. So when I hit theta equals, uh, pi, then this would be R0, this would be a real number. So this model I here, oh, I should use. So when I, so this, this guy would be a real number and this guy will be, will have model I less or equal than one. So when I take the log plus, well, the log is gonna be less or equal than zero. Then when I take log plus, this is gonna be zero. So the picture we are seeing is something like this. Okay, so it's from zero to pi. 
So that's the graph of H, and this is theta. And then I'm just extending it so that from minus pi, so that is odd. And then I extend this function periodically. Okay, so then it goes like this. But that's the window you want. Okay. Um, so then I would define this function g here, which is given by this uh, uh, Poisson kernel. Okay, and the reason why we do that is that uh, this function here, um, the real part of this function g coincides at the boundary of the unit disk with the real part with this function here. Uh, and we will talk about these things later on, but in, in this proof, uh, it's just an ad hoc uh, definition which will make total sense uh, after the first few classes, okay? But right now, uh, let me just stick with that. Um, and so we note that uh, the real part of G, if you take the real part of the simple computation, you will get uh, integral from minus pi to pi of one minus moduli of Z squared and e to i theta minus z squared h theta d theta, okay? And this thing here is called the Poisson kernel. Let's say p of z theta. This kernel here is the Poisson kernel. which another way of writing it is one minus R squared divided by one plus R squared equals two R cos theta minus theta zero if Z equals R e to I theta zero. Okay, so that's the Poisson kernel. And we will see this guy in the following classes when I talk about uh, uh, functions on the unit desk and uh, um, harmonic functions on the unit desk and the hardest spaces on the unit desk. Okay, but for the moment, let's stick with this definition. So it turns out that if I take, so Z here, I, I didn't say what Z belongs. So that has to be some guy less than one. So in the unit desk. So, um, so R here is a, a guy less than one, okay? So this is G's a kind of a auxiliary function we were using. And then what you can show is that when Z, uh, when Z here goes to the unit desk, so you have your unit desk and you have your Z and it's conversion to a point in the unit desk. Uh, if that happens, then you will see that the real part of, of G will converge to this guy here to H of, of theta, if, if, if this guy here is at the angle theta, okay? So in a way, this uh, function here, it is extending the function, oh, sorry, is extending the function H to the interior of the unit desk. So this, these are just uh, side comments. The important thing is the calculations uh, involving this function. Okay, so now what we have is, since I, I, I extended this function to the negative part of this integral as odd, we get the following. Just by the definition of the function h, uh, because we'll extend it as odd. Then you just take the real part now, 
And then it's, it's a simple computation, which I won't do, but just multiply. So when you, whenever you had something like this, you just multiply the denominator by its conjugate, and then you work out what is in the numerator, and then you add with the stuff, the same stuff you do here, and then in the end you get this result. So this would be equal to pi. So this would be integral from zero to pi. Four y h theta sine theta divided by h of i theta minus z squared and h of minus i theta minus z squared. Okay. Um, so you get this. So if you just do the splitting and then take the real part in each part of the splitting, then that's what you get. Okay. Great. So now, what do you do is the following. You consider this function f of z equals f of z divided by e to the g of z, okay, in the upper half plane. But now I will use for z less than one and y greater than zero. So really considering this, not anymore on the unit disk. This g was only defined on the unit disk, but only in the upper part of the unit disk. Okay. So I should maybe put uh, y greater equal than zero. Okay. Which I can do because f is continuous up to the boundary. Great. So then you see that, well, what's going on here? Well, you know that by this computation here on top, that, well, clearly, real part of G is positive. Okay. So if I take the model I of f of z for y positive greater or equal than zero, you will see that this is less or equal than model I of f of z uh, for um, uh, for model I of z less or equal than one and y greater or equal than zero. Um, stop. Yes. And then what you also see is that on the boundary, the real part of, uh, of Z is, um, so you also see that the real part G of Z, if model I of Z, uh, if, sorry, if Y equals zero, zero. So, so then you realize that that f of x equals f of x, which is less or equal than one for x real. In particular, if x is in this in this in this guy here. So, so. Okay. And now you will see that, well, what happens if model I of Z equals um, one? Well, if model I of Z equals one, um, what? Okay, so, Let me move to the second page here. Okay. Um, so, yeah, so basically, if model I of Z equals one, then you see that, uh, 
what I want to show is that F, capital F here, is less or equal than one if model I of Z equals one. So let's see what happens here. So if I put model I of Z equals one, and, and in the upper half plane, we get that, um, and we take the model I of capital F, then we have this real part here, which if I put equals one, um, vanishes. So then I will have only F, okay, of Z, um, and this has to be less or equal than one, why? Because, Yes, because why is this bounded by one in the unit here? Why it's bounded by one here? It should be, let's see. Um, because on the unit disk, oh, okay, on the unit disk, okay, I, I will have to use the property that I mentioned before. So on the unit disk, the real part. So on the unit disk, no, so, so, okay. So real part looks like it vanished, but it's not because I just said that it doesn't in this comment here, that the real part, when I put in the unit disk equals H of theta. Okay, so if I put Z equals uh, E to I theta, and I take the real part of G of E to I theta, then that's gonna be equal to H of theta, okay? But then H of theta is what? Well, H of theta is log plus of F of E to the power I theta. So when I take the exponential, that would be just greater or equal than uh, moduli of F of E to I theta, okay? And I'm gonna take it on the upper half plane, which means that only from angles from zero to pi, because I'm, um, I'm only here. So therefore I don't have this problem with the sign. I just, I just have this, this thing or something larger, which means, so that's, so maybe I should say that's here, which means that, so, so since a real part of G of I theta, equals log plus of f of e to i theta for theta between zero and pi, which is the region we are considering. So if I take, if I take e to the power g of e to i theta, and I take the moduli, that's gonna be e to log plus of something. So that's going to be definitely, um, um, definitely greater or equal than E, sorry, definitely greater or equal than F of E to I theta, okay? So then when I divide, so that implies that F of E to I theta moduli is less or equal than moduli I theta divided by F I theta, which is one. Okay. Okay, so here we had to use that property that I said that the Poisson kernel is just extending this function here. to so the whole complex to the inside of the unit disk, this function here to the inside of the unit disk. And uh, so the real part of G is the extension of this function to the inside of the unit disk. So then they agree at the boundary. Any questions here? I get a little bit confused. It, does it seem clear now? Okay, so great. So now we can, as I said before, there is a, a, insert, a maximum principle for this uh, half disk here and we can apply it. So, so that means that F of Z is less or equal than one 
for z less than one and y positive. Okay. So great. So knowing that, what I can do is do is take the log of this function, since f has this form here, I can just take the log uh, and see what I get. So when I take the log of the moduli, so when I take the moduli, it will be just e to the real part, which I have an explicit expression here. And so I can do all the computations. And in the end, what you get is that log of, so because f is less or equal than one in the interior, so log of f of z is gonna be less or equal than the computation we did above. And it should be h of theta, and then this should be uh, sine theta divided by some things, which is e to i theta minus z squared, and e to minus i theta minus z squared v theta. But then let me erase that and let me put the, the, the actual function, which is that. Okay, my handwriting is getting a bit messy. Anyway, that's what we have. And then, well, I'm taking log on the left side and there is a log plus on the right side. Well, let me just take the log plus on both sides. So let me put just plus here. Is this is, uh, um, otherwise, because the right-hand side is positive, so I can always put the plus here. Okay, so for this is z less than one and y positive. Then you see that the same argument works, let's say for uh, f of az instead of f of z, if a is some real number, positive real number, let's say uh, a positive, and then you will get a certain inequality like the one above, but then I could replace, and then we we'll replace uh, Z by W over A, for instance. So if I do this, I get a new inequality, which is this one here. A log plus f of a i theta sine theta and then I divide by and there is an a here now. Oh this is this is w and this guy should be imaginary part of w. This guy should be for a. Yes. D theta. Okay, and now W. So this now works for moduli of W less than a, and imaginary part of W positive. Okay, this is imaginary part. Okay. So it's the same computation as before, just with this f and some a positive, and you get a similar inequality like this, but then you just replace uh, z by w over a, and then you get this, okay? So now we're in, in a great shape where I'm almost over, because now we have almost in the shape of the limit we had in the condition. This already looks like something the limit we had in the in the in the hypothesis. So now I just um, so what we do now is we take an epsilon, a small, less than one. So if let's say if w. So if um, 
Yeah, so if W is less than epsilon A, let's say, so for some uh, epsilon less than one positive, okay, then we see that A I theta minus W is greater or equal than what? Well, we just do the obvious inequality. That will be A one minus model I of W over A, but that's greater or equal than, so it's greater than A one minus epsilon, okay? So then that's the inequality I would substitute here, okay? So then we get the log plus of FW is less or equal than one. So let me use this, this thing let me use uh, this thing and this thing in the inequality. And then what we get is the following. So what we can do is we bound this just by A squared. We bound this by the boundary that just produced here and this as well. And just make the, the, the calculations it, it, it derives. And then what you get in the end is the following. You get um, you get 2y divided by pi 1 minus epsilon to the 4. And then you get, um, yes, and then you get 1 over a integral from 0 to pi. Oh, not 2 over y, sorry, imaginary part of w. Um, log plus. Signed theta, the theta. So this, all this bottom part went away and you had a, a cube here basically. And there is a a to the power four here. So you just get a one over a. So everything looks correct. And well, this holds for every, again, for in this range here, uh, oh, sorry, but uh, with uh, this extra assumption here, but epsilon could be anything fixed between zero and one. So what I do is just take the limit inf in A on both sides. Well, instead of doing that, well, this holds, uh, uh, yeah, this holds generically for any epsilon you take as long as, as W is less than epsilon A. So what you do, yes, what you do is just take uh, the limit inf when a goes to infinity, then you conclude that the log plus of fw is less or equal than zero because, well, there is this term here, which we don't care, but then there is the limit inf as a goes to infinity of one over a integral from zero to pi of whatever which is exactly the, the condition in the theorem. So this thing here is zero. Okay. But then, well, well that's what we have. So, so now we conclude that log plus of fw it's less or equal than zero, but that exactly implies that FW is less or equal than one. Okay, and that finishes the proof. Okay, any questions here? So actually, if we don't make any assumption that this thing here, this aside comment, that this thing here is zero. So we could just take the limit in from both sides as A goes to infinity, and you would get an inequality. Let's say this less or equal than that, with this not being zero, but epsilon could be anything because you send A to infinity. So then you can send epsilon to zero, and so you have an inequality, and this would always hold. And whenever f is less or equal than one on the real line, and analytic in the upper half plane, 
you would get a, this inequality with this, without this being zero and with epsilon equals zero. Okay, so that's a, a already a bound. So maybe it's something to keep in mind. And when this is zero, then you conclude that f is bounded by one. Okay, great. We still have something like 50 minutes. So I would like to finish with the, the second theorem, which is basically a corollary of the, this one. Which is theorem two on the book. So, uh, so, so several times during the class, we, be, we have to build, as we, as we saw in this proof, certain auxiliary functions. And, and this is something you have to keep in mind whenever you're solving problems. Uh, uh, you, you need, whenever you're structuring your proof, sometimes it's clear that you're using certain auxiliary functions. So it's always nice to frame them so you put them separately and you say in the beginning, this is an auxiliary function that we use for a certain purpose, okay? In any way, uh, you will need certain auxiliary functions during this class and the theorem two will help build some of them. So that's why I think that De Bruyne is included in the book and that's the reason why he, he gave it. Okay, so let h of x, again, so x is real or continuous, and it will always be greater or equal than one continuous. Okay. And let's assume a certain decay. A log. Since it's greater or equal than one, it can take the wall log without any worry. And let's assume that this is finite. Okay. Uh, then the formula and the branches write it in a book in a slightly different way. But I prefer this way. for z in the upper half plane, then this formula defines a analytic function on C plus um, continuous on C plus closure, so up to the real line, and on the real line, the moduli agrees with your prescribed function H, okay? So bottom line, if you want to build a function on the upper half plane, oh, and one crucial, another thing, and f of z is uh, less than one for y positive. Oh, sorry, not less than one, of course, greater or equal than one. Okay. So this is a way of creating, so you have a function on the real line, you want to extend it to the upper half plane. Um, you know that your function is greater or equal than one, so you want to extend it in a way that it remains greater or equal than one. And this is the way to do it. So proof. Okay, so let me read the statement. 
Great, so how can we prove that? Um, well, first of all, it's easy to see that F is analytic. Well, because, well, this thing converges, this part, and this part here, as long as that is in the upper half plane, doesn't have any problem to put this, this will be analytic, will converge, and this will behave like O of one in terms of T, once you have fixed Z in, say, a compact uh, set in the upper half plane, or if Z is at a distance to the real line bounded from below, let's say, that the distance to the real line is greater or equal than 100 or greater or equal than 0 0.01, this will behave like O of one, so this whole integral will, will converge absolutely. You can even put absolute value here inside. So this defines an analytic function. And then we will show that it, it, it stands as, as continuous and it satisfies this in a moment. But the analytic part is easy, okay? Uh, so what we want to do is to take the log of this thing. So that's why we put an exponential here. And to take the log of the absolute part, in particular, we would have to compute a real part of that. And that's easy to do. It's a simple computation that I will write here. So the real part of one, one plus uh, T, Tz divided by I T minus Z. This you can compute is just Y one plus T squared divided by t minus z squared, okay? So therefore, if I take log of the model i, which would be then to take the real part of this guy here, we will get uh, y over pi integral from minus infinity to infinity of log of h of t divided by t minus z squared dt. Another way of writing this is uh, y over pi okay and this part here this guy here is what's called the Poisson kernel on the upper half plane, okay? So that this definition was purposely created so the Poisson kernel would show up here. And as the Poisson kernel in the unit disk, when I send y to zero, then uh, the function f, the function, this guy here should coincide with the value of this guy. Okay, when I send uh, x to zero, this integral here should converge to h of x. Sorry, when I send y to zero, this integral should converge to h of x, and this integral should converge to the log of f of x, okay? Oh, sorry, not h of x, uh, log of h of x. It's the function which is here evaluated at x. That this involves, if you know something about this, involves the like, uh, approximations of identity and etc., which we will do in the next classes, okay? But anyway, that's why this definition was, def was made this way. And now it's just a matter of realizing something. Well, easily, this thing is greater or equal than zero on the upper half plane, because y, h is greater or equal than one. So therefore, this guy is greater or equal than zero. So therefore, log of modulo i of f of z is greater or equal than zero. And so f of z is greater or equal than one if in the upper half plane. Great. The next bit uh, is just to show that we just have to show that the limit when let's say z converges to u, so let me write like x converges to u and y converges to zero, say u is a, 
uh, real value of the log of the moduli of f of z, this should be the log of um, h of u. That would show that f extends continuously to the real line and its value coincides with the value of h. Okay, so that would uh, solve the continuity part. Okay, but then you realize, well, since this is the Poisson kernel, what you realize is that it always has integral one. This always happens for every, sorry, for every y you put, let's say y positive. Well, first of all, it, this doesn't depend on x because we can just translate this integral and then uh, remove x. And then we just have this y, but then by the change of variables, we can remove that as well. Just change, uh, after you do it, the translation, you just can change t by yt, let's say, and then y will be gone. And then you just have to compute an integral, which is the integral of one over one plus t squared, and that's pi. So with this other pi here, um, you get one. Okay. So once you have this, then you know that the log, is black, and you know that the log of f of z minus the log of h of u in moduli will be equal the moduli of y over pi integral from minus infinity to infinity of say log of h of t minus log of h of u divided by t minus x squared plus y squared dt. Because, well, I can put inside the integral now because of this property. And then I can pass the moduli right to the inside and I get an inequality. Okay. And now it's fairly simple to show that this thing converges to zero if I send x to u and y to zero. Okay. Well, basically what you do is you, you, um, you select an epsilon. So, so let's say, um, so take an epsilon positive. So there is some delta, let's say positive. Uh, so that if uh, say, um, say um, if, T is less or equal than delta, then uh, the log of h of t minus log of h of u is less or equal than epsilon. So this is just by continuity. And then what you do is, well, you use, what you do is, let me see, let me give a name. Let me give a name to this integral here. Let me not give a minute. Let me just say the right hand side here, which will be this guy here. This whole integral. So the right hand side will be, uh, you will split in three parts. Integral from uh, u minus delta to u plus delta plus the integral from u plus delta to infinity, plus the integral from minus infinity to u minus delta of the stuff inside dt. So you have these three integrals. Sorry. Yep. So you have these three integrals and then what you do is that, well, you then bound this, this integral and this interval is just bound by the integral of the whole thing. 
you don't care. But then you realize, well, if T, well, oh, sorry, no, not, not so fast. Not so fast. So in this range here, you know that this, oh, you know that this bit is less or equal than epsilon by, the, by choice, okay? So this bit here, is just less or equal than uh, the integral from u minus delta to u plus delta of epsilon divided by whatever, which is the Poisson kernel, where you don't care. What you, what you know is that if you integrated this from minus infinity to infinity, that integral would be one, okay? Because you replace this upper part here by epsilon. So therefore, this whole thing is just less or equal than epsilon. So I can just erase everything and put epsilon. And now you have these things here. But then what, all you have to do is just to get rid of the dependency on, so y is going to zero. So what you can just simply do is just, you throw this away, this is positive. So you just throw this away, okay? And then in this bit here, since I'm far away from u, I can just lower bound this thing by something very trivial. For instance, I could do, I could just do like, uh, uh, let's say t, uh, t minus x is uh, say, is greater than t minus u uh, minus delta over two, for instance, because t is greater or equal than u minus delta. So it just, uh, yeah, u minus delta here, so it just, uh, subtract and add u, then you have t minus u, and then u minus x, that's the, um, so let me, so maybe I have to do this assumption. Uh, so let me, yes. so assume, let's say, x minus u is less than delta. Okay, so suppose I'm close, I'm taking the limit. So suppose I'm close, so then t minus x would be t minus u plus u minus x, and then u minus x is less than, oh, this is supposed to be like delta over two. So. And then u minus x is at most delta over two. So then that's why I use delta here. So then you can just bound this by, so t minus x by this quantity here. So then you removed completely this part here, the dependency on y, just throw away, and the dependence on x, you, you removed and just put that, okay? So then this integral here, which I'm doing in this interval there, is just, uh, doesn't depend on x and y, okay? And it converges because I'm away from uh, having some singularity on the bottom by this inequality here, okay? So then you just have this y on, on the outside, but y is going to zero, okay? So I will leave you to fill the details. You can read the book. So this would be just, uh, let's say, O of Y plus, and this would be just O of Y, this last two integrals. So by, so by, By this calculation, we just conclude that uh, the right-hand side, when y is converging to zero, and when uh, and when uh, x is converging to u, then we conclude that uh, the right-hand side is going to be less, let's say, the two epsilon, if y is small. and uh, x minus u is less than delta over two. And that finishes the proof. Okay, so this is a very standard kind of procedure. This is very standard when you have uh, an approximate identity uh, um, in the works here, which we have, it's a Poisson kernel. That's a very standard procedure. You just separate the integral where the, uh, in the region where the integral is accumulating, which would be that, 
and the remaining terms should be like arrow terms going to zero um, with the parameter of the approximated entity, which in this case was y. So that's why you get like O of y here. And this is for those who know, uh, who did already some class in analysis, meaning you have this approximated entity. But those who don't know, we just saw the, the, how these things work. And these things, this kind of argument also works for other kind of kernels, not just the Poisson kernel, but any other uh, kind of approximate identity. So like the Gaussian kernel um, and et cetera, in other, uh, in other ones. Any questions in this proof? Okay, four seconds, so no questions. So now just to finish, I want to uh, put the problem set. So the problem set from left for next week, maybe I can put it in here. So the problem for next week, which I think will be in November 10, and it's always midnight, you should send up to midnight, of course. And it's just problems. One, two, three, four, five. Okay. These are not, if I recall, these are not that hard. This is just, uh, this is apply the theorem. And, and, and you get it. it doesn't, there isn't much to think. Okay. So I think we'll finish. Does anybody has any other questions? Uh, maybe not in, about the proofs, but maybe about the, the course and et cetera. Okay, so stop recording.